Release That Witch, Audiobook, Part 104 Chapter 1443, Eleanor The change in the attitudes and the beliefs of the two senior lords did not only bring about the island formed out of the deity of gods. Aside from the sparks of flames that occurred quietly at the foot of Hermes, the battle at the western front stopped because of the absence of red mist. Although there were activities from remaining monstrous beasts at the impassable mountain range, they soon sank into an eternal silence following the depletion of magic power. This greatly decreased the burden placed on the First Army, and Cage Mountain was no longer a life or death barrier that required protection. In a week, countless troops returned from the front lines and assisted the west front of Neverwinter, alleviating the originally situation which was running on fumes. The influx of reinforcements instantly reversed the situation at the western region. The new tanks that appeared on the ground charged through the hordes of demonic beasts, surrounding the invisible blade beasts like a net. Once the demonic beasts were gathered together, they became strike zones for the aerial knights. All the railway blockhouses that were abandoned before were gradually captured again, with the carcasses of mutated beasts lying all around. If not for the terrifying rate at which they decayed into black water, the entire development would have piled up with stinking corpses. Despite Valkyries's theory that the demonic beasts were merely an evolutionary farm for the Sky Sea Realm and were of extremely limited effect on the battlefield, while the true danger laid at the back, the restabilization of the situation was undoubtedly important to Neverwinter. It was inevitable that the Sky Sea Realm would make a large scale effort to enter the Land of Dawn with the overrun of the demon's front lines. This was where the First Army had to gather its strength, instead of dividing into two different battlefields. Roland sighed and began embarking on Eleanor's rescue. Although the movement of the Birth Tower, which was also the movement of the Obelisk, had always been Mask's responsibility, the other senior lords had more or less heard and learned how to do so after so many years. The core step was naturally the altering of the Mother of Souls, allowing it to meld with new mineral veins as one. Only Mask and the higher ascendants that followed him were aware of this technique, but they were able to skip this step, since the body that Eleanor obtained was a finished product. Secondly, the Mother of Soul had to be sufficiently robust enough to survive the transplant. This sounded extremely easy to understand, but the transplant would deal severe injuries on the Mother of Soul just like on trees. Now that the Mother of Soul was Eleanor, Roland could only trust her. Lastly, the Mother of Soul could not be without the Red Mist, which meant that before the obelisk resumed its production of Red Mist, it had to remain in an environment rich with the mist. This was the most difficulty point for the entire rescue operation. Fortunately, Haxord had participated in the operation. His distortion door held significance in the logistics, fully displaying its extraordinary ability in such a situation. After finalizing the plan, the Ministry of Industry was the first to engage. To pull the immobile Eleanor out of the red mist, they had to grasp her position first. The interior of the Deity of Gods was a forbidden zone for witches, unexpectedly allowing Rex's diving suit to yield a miraculous effect. Using suspension ropes, more than ten sand nationals equipped with the diving suits plunged into the Red Mist Lake. The verification of Eleanor's position at a 150 meters depth was confirmed by the lead man named Simbad. Following that, the humans slowly peeled the Mother of Soul off the obelisk before securing her firmly with ropes. A Mother of Soul in its original state wielded strength comparable to a carrier, and with its nearly inseparable link to the tower, it was almost impossible to separate her. But the withering of the obelisk made the lifting feasible. Even if they never took any action, the obelisk would still have slowly crumbled into debris. When the Mother of Soul was lifted to a higher altitude within the red mist, Sky Lord opened a distortion door beneath it and moved Eleanor into a unique metal container. Naturally, a large amount of red mist was injected into it along with her. When this step was completed, everyone heaved sighs of relief. The subsequent procedures were much simpler. Farina's steam-powered trucks took responsibility for the transportation, carrying not only the metal container but many red mist tanks, nutrients for the Mother of Soul, as well as supplies for Sky Lord. 
Through a series of distortion doors, the fleet completed the transport from Sea Windshire to Neverwinter in half a day. If not for Hacksword's insistence on leaving, Roland would have granted him the position of a logistics head. Under the careful watch of the God's Punishment Witches, the metal container was swallowed by Fran and sent into the lower levels of North Slope Mountain's mine. This concluded the entire operation. Under the coordination of the administrative office, close to 10,000 personnel of different races had been mobilized to complete the transportation that consisted of crossing through more than half of Greycastle's line of fire. The only thing left for Roland was to wait. North Slope Mine, Godstone Mining Region. Pasha held a tank of red mist and carefully poured it over the root of an ugly monster. It resembled a ball with sludge-like tentacles growing all over its body, with a symmetrical pair of compound eyes over its head, the size of it equaling to three central carriers. Even without a stone of measuring, she could feel the immense magic power accumulated within it. This demon named the Mother of Soul was the catalyst that allowed the stone pillars to turn into red mist towers. It was said that only when the magic power density in the world reached its peak would the Battle of Divine will begin. Before receiving the transplantation technique, the demons could only lay low and wait quietly for the Bloody Moon and for their opportunity to arise. If this had been the era of the Union, Pasha wouldn't mind sacrificing her life to if she had the opportunity to kill a Mother of Soul. But now, it was as though she was taking care of a child, meticulously caring for this mother of soul. The contrast made even her feel slightly surprised. As expected, you're here. A familiar voice suddenly sounded from behind her. How's her situation? Pasha turned and bowed her main tentacles. Your Majesty, there hasn't been any signs of her gaining consciousness yet. The person was none other than Roland. Other than the existing ancient witches of Tequila, he was considered Eleanor's most frequent visitor. Seems like moving her was truly a painful experience for her. Roland sighed. But I heard from Celine that Lady Eleanor had already made the promise. Pasha's voice did not sound overly dejected. From what I know, she rarely makes promises. But once she does, she will abide to it. I hope so too. Roland slightly nodded. After observing alongside each other, Pasha broke the silence. Thank you, Your Majesty. You've already thanked me multiple times. He replied somewhat helplessly. Ever since the ancient witches found out that the three chiefs and their other companions were alive within the central carrier, their emotions and response could nearly be described as fervent, earning him unanimous gratitude from them. However, Pasha seemed to be unsatisfied with a single expression of her gratitude and expressed her thanks almost every time she met him. Eleanor contributed greatly to Grey Castle, saving her as part of my responsibility. My gratitude isn't merely for this, but for what you've done for everyone. Regardless of the number of times I thank you, I am unable to convey this appreciation of mine, so. Let me say it a few more times. The emotional speech from Pasha startled Roland. He turned to her, almost wanting to see her current expression from her lowered tentacles. Little did he expect that this look caused his heart to skip a beat and almost cry out loud, without them realizing it, the mother of soul's symmetrical eyes were wide opened and observing the two quietly. You're already someone several centuries old. For such unruly words to come out of your mouth is truly surprising. A new voice sounded in his mind. Pasha jolted and immediately used her main tentacles to cover her face. Lady, Lady Eleanor? Yes, it's me. Pasha immediately positioned her main tentacles straight and pulled herself towards the cave entrance with a breath before disappearing further into the cave. Ah. Uh, she has always wanted to be the first to talk to you. The corners of Roland's mouth twitched as he muttered in disbelief. By the way, you awoke just like that? If not how? With a thunderboom, or from an earthquake? Eleanor yawned. That's Alice's style, not mine. Roland took a long time before he continued the conversation. All right, it's good that you're fine. Since my job is complete, the next thing will be to see. I've completed mine as well, Eleanor replied languidly. What? The transplant process was truly unbearable but it was enough for me to suffer alone without hindering the thought processes of the others, 
she replied matter-of-factly. The analysis of the magic power cores is complete. Although we are unable to construct one at the moment, it wouldn't be much of an issue to use one that is already available. In other words, your floating island can fly at any moment. At this point, Eleanor paused for a moment, before quipping. Or, why not now? Chapter 1444, The Riddles of the Consciousness It seems like their description of Eleanor as being amiable and approachable is true. Comparing her to Alice, Roland found it difficult to imagine that a transcendent that emitted a cold and imposing aura would ever say such words. No. I believe you. He waved his hand immediately. The current North Slope Mountain was connected to a huge industry district, so any sudden flight would be a recipe for disaster. You should really believe me only after I've activated the core instruments, Eleanor replied somewhat regretfully. From her tone of speech, it sounded as though she was extremely regretful to be unable to reveal her abilities right away. Roland gained some understanding with regards to her personality. Her self-acknowledgement of not being a qualified leader did not mean she was ordinary. She had aspects that she prided herself with. Anyone that became a transcendent was a lofty existence without exception. Right? When did you wake up? About a quarter of an hour ago. So you've been eavesdropping from the beginning. Roland cursed inwardly. Then why didn't you tell us? Nobody made it a rule that it's compulsory to announce to the world that they have woken up, right? Eleanor replied matter-of-factly. Then why did you speak up in the end? What other reason can there be? Do you really want me to see my junior embarrass herself? The two rows of eyes at the top of her head rolled upwards in unison. The rolling of eyes at such a large scale was quite a magnificent sight. It's because of your sudden awakening that makes it even more embarrassing. Seeing Roland speechless, Eleanor casually changed the topic. In all honesty, I am rather satisfied with you at the present. Why is that? He realized that he could hardly follow her train of thought. Because there aren't any traces of exploitations here, Eleanor replied. Ever since my connection with this region, I can feel that the foundation of this god's stone pillar is fully preserved, proof that you don't have ideas over it. She means that I didn't exploit this mine which indicates that I've never had the intent to control the witches. Roland realized the meaning behind her words. Celine should have told you about the witch union, could it be that you didn't believe her? Of course not. It is just that people get deceived easily by facades, especially from words by an omnipotent king. It would not be difficult for you to fake everything, Eleanor stated bluntly. Even if you adhere to such a position for now, it doesn't mean that you will be the same in the future. Planning ahead is a matter that every leader has to consider. If you harbored any wariness, it would be impossible for you not be tempted by this god's stone mine. Secretly arranging to mine, storing, and taking precautions against the witch's power that would become too potent for you to control, while maintaining a kind and friendly front. Isn't that what usually happens? Roland sighed. That is because too many people treat witches as a different species, but in my eyes, they are just humans with slightly advantaged. You're fine even if the witches occupy all the important positions in the kingdom? What you're asking should be Alice's assertions, right? Roland replied bluntly. As long as humanity continues to exist, witches will definitely return to the peak. They actually told you that as well? It was the first time Roland heard Eleanor exclaim in surprise. No, but that was what I saw in the sigil of recording, Roland admitted. In fact, Alice has been mistaken as well. As long as the word which is switched to human, wouldn't this sentence be normal and expected? If outstanding individuals are prevented from leading the civilization, the civilization is doomed to have no future. At the same time, if the leader at the peak no longer strives for the benefit of the people, the civilization will not last as well. In some sense, random awakenings, the inability to have children, and magic power could be considered a special ability, and should have never been a rift between the talented and the ordinary. The most dangerous aspect was artificial selection and designated inheritance, which prevented the misgivings between witches and ordinary people to cease. You. 
Eleanor looked at him in a bid to figure out his true thoughts. But after a moment, she gave up. I shall wait and see. What are your plans, going forward? We will be executing a large-scale remodeling of North Slope Mountain to be a suitable flying stronghold. This was another reason Roland did not allow Eleanor to lift the floating island right away. Regardless of attacking the new deity of gods or moving to the bottomless land, they had to amass a substantial amount of supplies. Upon leaving Neverwinter, it would be difficult to have resupplies. Can you estimate the volume of the floating island? It shouldn't be a problem. Eleanor blinked her eyes and nodded. Aside from the remaining vein, the Red Mist Tower also takes into account the range and augment accordingly, so it is impossible if you want it to be as big as the Deity of Gods. How do the Red Mist Towers grow? I was equally curious as you on this, so I spent a bit more time investigating this body. I discover that it can assimilate the God Stone Pillar into the body. Simply put, while the God Stone doesn't reveal any signs of life in an ordinary circumstances, it will start to self-duplicate upon its binding to a mother of soul. The process depends on the quality of the Godstone, using it too much will put an end to the magic power within. Then, Roland hesitated for a moment. Are you able to create red mist? This question caused Eleanor to sigh. Yes, in fact, not only do I have control over the various unique abilities of the mother of soul, I even have a deeper understanding of their intricacies. For example, the Red Mist Lake can be considered a type of demon as well, as they are all produced in the same manner. You mean to say, Roland was surprised. That's right, be it mad demon, fearsome demons, or lords of hells, they are produced that way. I found information within the Mother of Soul related to them. But to incubate the demons, there are a few crucial factors lacking, and the one to supply the crucial factors to the Mother of Soul is considered king. Roland was dumbstruck. Although he knew that the demons did not need to mate, he never thought that they would reproduce in such a manner. In other words, it is possible for me to become the king of demons as well, isn't it ironic, one of the three chiefs will be a demon producer one day. Eleanor then glared at him. You have to remember everything you said, don't make me stay here for too long. This will depend on our advancement in magic power and not me, Roland thought to himself helplessly. But what was on his mind went deeper, through the shift of consciousness, Eleanor had practically obtained all the information stored within the Mother of Soul, and just like learning, she could, in a sense, obtain the legacies. It was inevitable that the different legacies from the different races would end up mixed and evolved was inevitable. But why would God be superfluous and use the battle of divine will and legacy shards, for the races to kill each other to push for it to happen? Secondly, what mattered was consciousness itself. It was a clear-cut distinction in the world where technology was still primitive. Access and a shift of consciousness was simple, as though there was no technique or skill involved. If God were the only one that had the ability to do so, Roland would have let it slide. But why were the underground civilization, demons, and humans capable of it as well? In his previous world, simulating perception remained a concept and only existed in television shows. He had a vague feeling that the two might be related. Chapter 1445 The Island That Will Never Fall Upon returning to Grey Castle from North Slope Mountain, Roland invited City Hall Director Barov and Minister of Construction Carl to his office. I need the administrative office to start on a new metallurgy material supply plan as quickly as possible and move the production from the center of North Slope Mountain to other locations, be it Longsong Stronghold or Redwater City, the only guarantee that I need is that the production cannot be inadequate. North Slope Mountain will no longer be mineable soon. The expressions of the two men changed. After glancing at each other, Carl lowered his head, while Barov spoke with much difficulty. Your Majesty. Has the situation in the North deteriorated that badly? North? Roland was startled for a moment before realizing that the two had assumed that a new powerful enemy had appeared at the Fertile Plains that not even the First Army could handle. Hence, to protect the city, they had to give up on North Slope Mountain. Amused and exasperated, Roland shook his head. 
the army hasn't degenerated to the point that we have to lie about our victories so as to appease the people. Furthermore, you are in charge of logistics, you should be able to grasp the general situation from the drop in medical supplies being supplied out. How can you ask such a question? Barov hurriedly wiped the cold sweat from his forehead. Ha ha ha. I thought your majesty was provisioning for bad times. In fact, I have been curious from the beginning, thinking which which was the one who discovered news about the Sky Sea Realm that the administrative office hadn't been informed in a timely fashion. If that is the case, why are you giving up on the mines in North Slope Mountain? Carl couldn't help but ask. Because that mountain is about to fly soon. Roland shrugged. The two fell silent once again, but wearing weird expressions on their faces this time, as though questioning themselves if they had heard wrongly. You heard that right. It will fly soon and become a floating island. Roland looked at the two with interest, and recounted everything about the ancient witch, Eleanor, as well as their gaining of control over the magic power core. Remember the metal container that the administrative office transported from before? The central carrier for the deity of gods was contained inside. But due to the risks involved in transplanting it, we were unable to determine the outcome until the final moment, therefore, I didn't inform all of you about the details. But now you can know that the project was successful, Neverwinter will soon have a floating island as part of its territory. Barov widened his eyes, momentarily at a loss for words. As for Carl, he trembled in excitement. He asked in a trembling voice, Your Majesty, what you want is not just a giant rock, right? That's right. Roland no longer kept them in suspense. It will be a floating battleship, a stronghold that will never fall. It must be able to provide months, if not a year's supply for large numbers of soldiers on an assault mission. It is both capable of taking the initiative to attack our enemies, and it naturally possesses defensive capabilities. How long do you think you need to transform North Slope Mountain into something like that? With his engineering background, he completely understood Carl's excitement. Any ambitious architect hoped of having their own work placed in the most inconceivable of places. To be able to personally create the floating city was definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. According to the scale of the project benchmarked against typical projects, it would require about four to five years, but I believe that your majesty cannot wait that long. Besides, a floating city cannot be considered an ordinary undertaking, Carl immediately answered. Considering its unique features, the Ministry of Construction can send a team of engineers to reside in the structure while it moves. If I didn't misinterpret your majesty's intentions, I believe you definitely wish for the aerial knights to be stationed permanently on it as well. So long as there is stopover point on it for resupply, their attacking and defensive capabilities will far surpass that of cannons. It seemed like after building over ten runways, the Minister of Construction had formed a deeper understanding towards the Air Force. Roland smiled and nodded, continue. The requirements for the aerial knights includes having a runway, storehouses, fuel oil and ammunition reserves. We already have feasible blueprints for them, and will take at most a week to be completed. Your Majesty, Carl placed his hand across his chest. The minimum we will need is a week. In a week, it will satisfy your most fundamental requirements, the rest can be broken into phases, to add on, perfect, and extend. What about the materials for construction? Barov asked. Once the North Slope Mountain takes off, it will be difficult to transport them upwards. Leave that to me to ponder. When it came to professional queries, Carl always planned in advance. North Slope Mountain's mountainside has a sizable lake formed naturally from the spring water that comes from the mountain top. The engineering team can enclose it and form a natural water reservoir to supply water for daily use and construction. Secondly, we can excavate the mountain to obtain limestone required for cement. I believe that Lady Eleanor wouldn't mind having the floating island slightly lighter. Bricks, lumber, all of these, can be obtained on the spot, while materials such as steel should be prepared ahead of time. If Miss Hummingbird is willing to help, I think that we can load up a considerable amount of resources. Aside from that, the third border city's tequila witches can assist as well. 
As long as we make minor changes to the contiguous caves, they will form the best warehouses. With all of these things, even if we are unable to resupply the floating island in the short term, the project team can continue working for at least a year or two. He turned to Bariff. Of course, if the furnace area and steelmaking plants are preserved, this amount of time will undoubtedly extend. Roland could not help but to clap. The proposed plan was the most suitable method considering the time constraints, ensuring that the floating island possessed the basic fighting capabilities in the shortest time, and leaving the other constructions, like residential, functional buildings to the later for improvement. Bariff, what do you think? It means that aside from the First Army, we will need a large population living on it. The old director stroked his beard. I will have to think up a recruitment plan. Roland smiled in satisfaction, it appeared that the duo had grasped the crux of the plan. The floating island meant going for a long and drawn-out battle away from the mainland, and the living conditions in the early stages was incomparable to those in Neverwinter. As a result, be it the promotion or remuneration, the administrative office had to prepare adequately, only a group of zealous workers brimming with determination would complete the task sufficiently. In the past, it was Roland that personally took the lead for the planning. With Bariff taking up the position, he obviously had a clear understanding of his governing principles. Go ahead as discussed. Roland finally gave the go-ahead. Welcome back, my lord. When Victor entered the office in Miracle Building, Tinkle immediately rushed forward and welcomed him just like back in the hotel. The Rainbow Stone business was picking up, with many competitors appearing. To safeguard his supply, he had no other choice but to move between Everwinter and the Port of Clearwater. Although the operation was draining, he took pleasure in it. Compared to the uncertain jewelry business, he was far closer to his initial target than before, to become a successful businessman to support the family. Just as Victor extended a hand out, Tinkle handed a copy of Grey Castle Weekly to him. This tacit understanding made him smile. Although the poor of Clearwater also had the weekly newspapers, there was always a two to three weeks delay. Towards a city like Neverwinter, two or three weeks was enough for great changes. As expected, the large header on the front page immediately captured his attention. Heading for the skies, official announcement of the Heaven Plan. Chapter 1446, Sky Carrier the key to ending the Battle of Divine Will has been found. Victor muttered to himself. His Majesty is determined to take the initiative and attack our enemies to end the flames of war outside the Fertile Plains? Even after experiencing so many inconceivable matters in the past, the headlines was still as shocking as before. Every line was worth being elaborated. Back in the past, such news would have never left the confines of royalty much less an ordinary businessman like him of zero noble status. The report had an extremely grand drawing, the commotion caused by the descent on the floating island into the sea did not announce the end of the demon's attack. Thousand of kilometers away, a new Blackstone stronghold was rushing towards Neverwinter through day and night. Beneath it held millions of demons, enough to drown the entire human kingdom. To prevent this from occurring, the king had decided to take action and prevent the flames of war from affecting the ordinary citizens. Upon defeating the approaching enemies, the king would send out an expeditionary force to the other side of the world where the boundary between both continents existed, to remove the threat of the battle of divine will. Upon obtaining success, a long and peaceful era would emerge, and be it demons or demonic beasts, nothing would ever threaten the safety of mankind. Victor was familiar with expeditions, since he had personally witnessed a miracle more than a year ago. Relying on the heavy machinery called a train, the First Army had transported troops to the deserted Fertile Plains almost 500 kilometers away and defeated the demons that occupied the northern ruins. At that time, Grey Castle Weekly had a detailed written record of the entire process, with a realistic drawing termed as a photograph. Victor could still recall the sensation of overlooking the black trains rushing headlong into the Fertile Plains. But this time, King Roland seemed to have taken one step further, one that was even more thorough. He's actually planning on moving a mountain into the sky to become an expedition stronghold. Can it truly be accomplished by human hands? 
Victor eagerly flipped to the second page. He saw the plan being divided into three phases, the first being the liftoff stage. The entire North Slope Mountain and a kilometer of soil beneath would be escape the restraints of the impassable mountain range and become a single entity. The second phase was flight test stage. North Slope Mountain would be integrated into the Army and be conferred with the name Eleanor Skycruiser officially. In this phase, the floating island would patrol Neverwinter's surroundings multiple times for training as well as await the perfect opportunity to attack. The last phase was the official set off to fight the enemy a thousand kilometers away. The administrative office termed the battle as the war to decide the fate of mankind. Aside from soldiers, the support provided by various professions was equally as important. Thus, the remuneration given were rather handsome, two to three times that of a peer working in a similar job in Neverwinter. Aside from that, volunteers would have their name added onto a monument that would stand tall perpetually inside King City. Additionally, Lord Bariff divulged at the end that only those who volunteered to go aboard the floating island would have the opportunity to witness mankind's strongest weapon in history. At this point, Victor realized that the administrative office would be crammed to the point where not a single drop of water could flow through. The difference between Neverwinter's citizens and migrants from other cities was how they viewed the floating island. When he interacted with the locals, he often got the misconception that the land not only belonged to King Roland, but that they also had a share in it. Furthermore, once an individual settled into the city and received his identity card, they would have the similar acknowledgement and sentiments towards the land, because he had experienced it for himself before. He would even hear migrants from the Kingdom of Dawn discussing about Neverwinter's various miracles with pride, something that was unheard of before. If not for his business, Victor had the urge to ascend the floating island and experience and witness everything. Connect me to the administrative office, tell them that Rainbow Stones is willing to contribute a thousand sets of clothes. Yes, my lord. Tinkle nodded. Right, have you asked about North Slope Mountain's exact flight date? It should be within the next two or three days, the mountaintop already looks completely different from before. In two or three days. I'm afraid that the good seats have already been snatched clean. Victor folded the newspaper and walked to the window. Although the Miracle Building was tall, it was too far from the impassable mountain range. Victor felt it appropriate to witness the marvel at close proximity. He turned and took out a key. Tinkle, you should know what to do, right? Fortunately, anything that could be solved with money was not considered a big matter to him. Leave it to me, my lord. Tinkle smiled and accepted the key. Three days later, the First Army removed the cordon tape at the foot of the mountain, indicating to the public that the moment they had been waiting for was about to arrive. The current North Slope Mountain was completed different from before. From a distance, one could see dense scaffolding all around, the irregular mountain walls had been artificially remodeled, not only were the walls smoothened, there were various places that had been patched up. All of the patches that were either made out of metal or lubricating oil fabric were distinctly out of place with the stone walls, but made the natural structure look more like a weapon. What shocked Victor the most were the several hundred strips of flags that hung down from a high elevation. They were just like a skirt for the mountain that undulated like waves along with the wind. The tower and rifle emblem symbolized Grey Castle Kingdom. The red, black, and white colors made it even more dignified. The visual impact was one that would live eternally in everyone's mind. The crowds on the street grew and by noon, all the main streets had become impenetrable. If not for the black-clothed policemen and army personnel directing the crowd towards the misty forest, half the city would be in deadlock. Following the deep and resounding alarm that resonated through the entire city, Victor, positioned at an exceptionally good spot on the roof of a building in West Street, felt tremors from the soles of his feet. Very quickly, the tremors turned into loud rumblings. In that instant, it felt as though the entire Neverwinter had boiled over, it was the sound of the mountain being ripped apart. Despite being expectant of the proceedings, witnessing the scene firsthand caused Victor to gape in shock. Tinkle grabbed onto his arm tightly. North Slope Mountain slowly ascended in an indomitable fashion, releasing dust from the severed connections with the impassable mountain range. 
The scaffolding situated on the surface collapsed, seemingly powerless at restraining so gigantic. The fallen trees, gravel, and scaffolding were left behind, but were later lifted up by the even wider bottom. The entire scene resembled a radish being pulled out of the soil, except that the soil spanned over a kilometer of land. The floating island was in a distinct triangular shape with the lowest point situated at the center of the island. With the rise of North Slope Mountain, a gigantic pit was left in the ground surface, and faced with the sudden disappearance of the roof, countless underground creatures scurried away, becoming one of the vivid footnotes in this historical event. This should have been an impossible task unachievable with human strength. But the flag swaying on the mountain announced that there was no mistake, it declared that it belonged to Grey Castle Kingdom, to mankind. After waking up from their shock, the crowd erupted into deafening cheers. Once the first cries of long live his majesty sounded, it was destined that the chanting would not stop until a long while after. It took a long time for the feverish atmosphere to abate. Victor licked his dry lips and was about to bring Tinkle back to the hotel when he caught sight of an elderly figure on another roof from the corner of his eye. The figure looked so familiar that he slowed down in his tracks Victor tried to take a better look, only to discover that the figure was gone. My lord, what is it? Tinkle sensed his strange behavior. No, it's nothing. I might have been seeing things. Victor hesitated, because no matter how he saw it, the old man somewhat resembled his father. But how can father appear here? He shook his head, and quickly threw the thought to the back of his mind. Chapter 1447 The Unfulfilled Promise Inside Greycastle's parlor, Roland quietly observed the old man before him. Seated in a wheelchair with a head full of grizzled hair, sunken cheeks and wrinkles bulging on his forehead, the old man was clearly approaching the final years of his life. But compared to his age, his eyes remained clear and youthful, with the vigor of an adolescent. The monocle hanging on his nose bridge and bow tie at his neck added a touch to his bearing. At the same time, the old man was also observing Roland. Roland broke the silence after a short moment as he revealed a smile. It truly wasn't easy inviting you over from the Kingdom of Dawn. Welcome to Greycastle's new King City, Mr. Bonnock Lothar. It must have been a long and tough journey for you. It is my honor to be received by the King of Greycastle. The old man lowered his head slightly. But may I ask, what does your majesty have for me? You've already contributed greatly to Grey Castle, there isn't anything you need to do. Me? The old man revealed a look of surprise. Your majesty, are you mistaken about something? Typically, a man at such an age would have their thought processes slowed down substantially, their speech turning inarticulate or stammering, but not only did Bonnock Lothar reply promptly, he managed to control his facial muscles to maintain a poker face, enough to prove that his mind had never stopped or slowed down. Compared to the inevitable aging of the body, his mind was still working at his prime. I know of your concerns, but be at ease, I have no ill intentions towards black money. Roland spread open his hands. The oracle that delivered the information to you was from Neverwinter. In fact, I was the one to decide that the information was to be delivered to you. By using Pasha as his mouthpiece and using the reason of it being the opportune moment for the incarnation ceremony as way to summon Bonnock Lothar, Roland had men forcibly take him back to the castle upon verifying his identity. Although this method was considered crude, it was straightforward. Your Majesty. I don't understand what you mean. It's fine. I will explain it until you do, this is a very complicated story, but I assure you that it's real." Roland then narrated the story of the ancient witches, as well as the essence of the God's Punishment Army's incarnation ceremony. Soul containers only accepted consciousness that had magic power, in other words, non-magic humans could only turn into empty shells. In a sense, turning into a shell with no consciousness coincided with how the ancient witches extended their lives. If Black Money was an ordinary underground chamber of commerce, Roland would not have paid much attention to it. But Black Money had contributed greatly during the Western Front's military campaign against the demons, not only by assisting in providing intelligence network and Kingdom of Wolfheart and Everwinter, 
but they had also sent out crucial reports and filled the empty spaces which the witches were unable to investigate as a result of the areas being filed with red mist. Perhaps Bonak Lothar's intent was never to help mankind or save humanity, but the contribution was tangible. Roland did not believe that turning a man of such meritorious deeds into a puppet without consciousness was a suitable reward, thus, he chose to personally interview him. After a long while, Bonak Lothar took off his monocle and spoke with trembles in his voice. You mean to say that eternal life is nothing but a scam? Roland sighed. At the present, the only ones capable of maintaining their consciousness and not age have to be magic power users. For humans, only witches can do that. Even Roland himself, who opened up the dream world, was incapable of instigating a response from the soul container. But after drinking all of that medicine, I truly feel that my body has turned for the better, it doesn't mean that the medicine is useless. It increases the success rate of the ceremony by overdrafting one's vitality, but it cannot go on continuously like that, Roland interrupted and shook his head. Very quickly, the side effects will surface, and that is the reason why I have sought you so urgently. Bonak Lothar was stunned. You mean to say, my days are numbered? I'm sorry, Roland replied lamentably. I am unable to deliver a perfect promise, and can only attempt other means to make up for it. Black money protected the witches, and contributed so much to the battle of divine will. If you have anything on your mind, tell to me. We owe that to you. Nightingale had questioned Roland earlier, to have Pasha and the others resolve issue on their own. By using the king's identity, it meant shifting the responsibility of the entire scam onto Grey Castle itself. Nightingale was right, but Roland was aware that since Grey Castle accommodated all the tequila witches, it not only meant enjoying the benefits of their abilities, but shouldering their faults as well. Bonak Lothar remained silent for a long time. Are you able to handle the matter, even in the Kingdom of Dawn? You should know that of my influence on the Kingdom of Dawn then I am at ease. Unexpectedly, the other party did not fall into despair or turn hysterical, but instead revealed a calm smile. The reason for my desire to live longer is to ensure the survivability of black money for my children. If I die, the other businessmen will not let this piece of the pie go. With such large benefits laid in front of them, a few lives are worth nothing. If your majesty is willing to get involved, I believe that no one will dare act blindly that itself is much more reliable than me living longer. If that is the case, why should I harbor a grudge? Roland muttered to himself irresolutely, then spoke to him. Are you sure you want that, as your reward? Your Majesty, is that not possible? It is possible. He paused for a moment. Have you ever heard of the name Rainbow Stones? I have heard of it. Bonnock pondered for a moment. If I recall correctly, it is a brand new line of clothes for your distinguished country that operates at a massive scale, with some products sold even at the Kingdom of Dawn, but forgive me for saying this, the style and design is still far inferior to ours. That's because Victor only employed artisans from the Lothar's family. And he never told any of you that the price of such clothes is only a tenth of other clothes shop in Neverwinter. Roland coughed twice. From what I know, the founder behind this line of clothes is called Victor Lothars, your fourth son. Aside from that, the business revenue as of today has already surpassed 10,000 gold royals. With such a talent here, I believe that even without Greycastle's support, he will not lose to the other businessmen. 10,000 gold royals was definitely a large amount, with only the sale of Chaos Drink and Neverwinter being able to beat that record. The reason was simple not everyone needed beverages but everyone needed clothes. With the Neverwinter's population turning highly centralized, the demand for necessities exploded. In the face of a booming industry capable of producing large amounts of profits, the deals made within the underground chamber of commerces were nothing. This time, Bonak Lothar revealed genuine surprise. Your Majesty, is what you said. True? Ever since he left the City of Glow, we have rarely communicated. I thought he was still in the jewelry business. Victor is now in Neverwinter, it won't be difficult for you to meet him and verify if what I said was true or not. But. You have to make haste. Yes. 
I understand. Banak Lothar could no longer help grab onto this opportunity, his actions clearly revealing the emotions buried at the bottom of his heart. Please excuse me, your majesty. Roland nodded and was about to call for a few guards to send the old man out, when the latter spoke up again. You said that I have not much time left. Will it be possible for me to live my last few moments on the floating island? Roland closed his eyes. If that is your wish. When the doors closed, Nightingale appeared and whispered, Strange. What? In the beginning, his responses were strange, not to say that they were lies, but my magic power felt blurred, unlike the calm he presented. Nightingale shrugged. I see, Roland replied thoughtfully. You know why? Maybe. He lowered his voice and turned his head towards the window. The thing about eternal life is that it will always be attractive. When one's expectation fails to be met, it will be the most difficult thing to accept, regardless of who it is. But that's not a lie. Nightingale repeated herself. Because he knew that no matter what he does, he can never change the outcome, Roland replied wistfully. Since the outcome cannot be changed, he has to accept it, rather than hold a grudge and become enemies with the King of Grey Castle, why not act magnanimous and win a favorable impression? All other unnecessary emotions will simply turn into a sunken cost. That is what he most probably thinks. There are many that understand this, but very few are able to act on it. That is what's impressive about him. Roland somewhat understood why many of the businessmen in the Kingdom of Dawn were treated like nobles, their ability to split control and have stop losses made them far more capable than a vast majority of the nobles. As for you, at this point, Roland turned towards Nightingale. Not only are you able to discern between truth or lies, you're actually able to sense their emotions. Are you about to evolve? You think of me as a person who will intentionally hide the fact that I'm about to evolve, or in other words, am I that modest a person to you? Nightingale cast a glance at him and replied sourly. Ah. Uh, I have no response to that. Roland tactfully closed his mouth. Chapter 1448 The Black Giant Bird Ring. The telephone on the table rang. Roland spent a few seconds rummaging through a pile of machines before finding the connecting receiver, lowering his body and answering it. The label on the phone indicated that the caller was from the Aerial Knight Academy. Following the increase of lines to the office, Roland was compelled to add another table to his work area just to hold the phones. Really? I'll be right there. After hanging up, Roland stood up with a joyful expression. He picked up the coat hanging on his chair and draped it over himself. Was that Tilly? Nightingale asked, frowning. Yes, the preparations for the big plane is complete, they are going to have its trial flight soon. The so-called big plane mentioned by Roland was the design bureau of Greycastle's main focus, the four-engine strategic bomber. Upon finding out that there was the possibility of obtaining a mobile runway, Roland immediately sought for the relevant technical staff and inquired about the feasibility of changing out engines. The answer he received was, so long as minor adjustments were made to the existing weight, there would not be an influence on the yielding of pneumatics. But modifying the Phoenix's engine brought about a substantial drop in performance, for example, the takeoff required a longer runway before the Phoenix was able to lift off. The internal fuel capacity dropped by half, and its flight time dropped to a third of its original time. In all, the new planes were incapable of satisfying the demands previously raised for long-distance raids. The only advantage was that outcomes could be immediately seen. The Phoenix's engine was an improved model of the star-shaped engine, a model Anna completely grasped over a year ago. It was relatively more mature and robust compared to the engines allocated to the large-scale bombers, even though the Bureau had supplied detailed blueprints, the prototype had to be first tested, and that definitely affected the progress of the entire project. In reality, when the plan was initially formulated, the bomber had been prioritized in the one-year plan, and was already considered a brazen plan for Neverwinter. Even if nothing unexpected occurred during the research and development stage, its production would still have taken another half a year. 
if not for Senior Lord Mask's actions that caused Roland to realize that the deity of gods had an internecine ability, a year would not have been considered long. But now, the situation was substantially different, in the event where the deity of gods overdraft on the god's stone mine to ascend into the sky, destroying the core would not be able to prevent the floating island from falling and causing catastrophic destruction. With humanity's own skycruiser in the form of a floating island, losing bombers was no longer a huge cause of concern anymore. Crossing over a tangled mess of lines, Roland wore the coat whilst walking to the door. We should take a look as well, this might be history's largest plane. Clang, just when he passed the mahogany table, his sleeve suddenly pulled a teapot on the table. By the time Roland was aware of this, the teapot was already falling to the ground irreversibly. Ah. Nightingale moved slightly, her figure disappearing for an instant, but she was still one step too late. The teapot tumbled in midair, as though something invisible had struck it, before dropping and shattering into pieces on the ground with the boiled tea splashing all over. Your reaction seems to have slowed quite a bit, Roland quipped. In the past, you've never slipped up on such things. Have you been eating too much snacks that you've become heavier? Nightingale surprisingly didn't retort, and instead turned to look at her own hands. Leave it to the maids to clean it up, we need to head to the Aerial Knight Academy, Tilly is waiting for us there. At the Aerial Knight Academy runway, a black plane larger than the seagull was being towed out of the hangar. Aside from its massive size, the broad dual wings and the four engines installed below were the fighter plane's distinct features. Although the thick and short outline of the star-shaped engines was not aesthetically matching with the slender plane, the spectators did not seem to mind the disharmony, just its unprecedented size was enough to capture their attention. Compared to the fire of heaven's dexterous form, the pure black paint made the plane look like a gigantic creature lying prone on the ground. Good was no exception. His eyes never left the plane ever since it came out. If not for his personal experience of flying the fire of heaven, he would never have believed that such a heavy plane could actually fly. But even so, Good's heart was filled with shock and awe, from the fact that Neverwinter was able to produce such an exaggerated gizmo in a year of his absence, he simply felt that the queen's abilities were just too exaggerated. Finkin, on the other hand, could not give any other descriptions other than repeat how huge it was. I reckon that only the most outstanding of aerial knights will have the qualifications to operate this beast? Hines sighed with emotion. In our class, I think only good stands a chance. Not really. Unexpectedly, the one to reply to him was the usually cold instructor Eagle Face. According to what I know, the pilot of the bomber will not be selected from the current pilots. That doesn't mean that these people aren't outstanding but Princess Tilly believes that ensuring sky dominance is the main goal for the aerial knights. As long as the bomber is protected and any approaching enemies are shot down, it doesn't matter if the huge plane is operated by a team of recruits. Instructor. The three of them straighten their backs. Rest easy soldiers, I'm not here to reprimand you. Eagle Face glanced at them emotionlessly. You are all the best of the best among the aerial knights, have more confidence in yourselves. Yes. The three saluted. Everyone will be going up against the demon's main force soon. Work hard. Eagle Face turned and walked away with a wave of his hand. Finkin heaved a sigh of relief. Why do I feel that instructor is feeling especially... Gentle? Heinz added. Yeah. Good shrugged. But if the words we speak behind his back reaches him, he will not hesitate to send you guys to a week of toilet duty. The two immediately switched topics. Right at this moment, the black plane's propeller started spinning at high speeds, the loud humming noises drowning the discussions of the spectators. Even after so long, hearing the familiar and pulsating cadence caused Good's heart to pump with ardor. I really love flying. With the unending striking sounds of the pistons, the bomber gradually moved forward and gained speed, the entire process took longer than the fire of heaven, but upon reaching the end of the runway, it still only lifted its nose by a bit. Gravity no longer had its clutches on the plane. It was as though the black beast had expanded its wings while facing the damp sea breeze to climb to the skies. After its takeoff, 
the bomber adjusted its direction and flew northwest of Neverwinter. In that direction, the floating North Slope Mountain appeared especially strikingly. Good knew that the essential factors to their initiative had been completed. The time for the decisive battle was right in front of their eyes. Chapter 1449, Journey Together After dealing with all official business, Roland returned to his room and saw Anna arranging her clothes, with a large leather suitcase at her side. Ah. Uh, what are you doing? Can't you tell? She patted the folded clothes. Preparing for a long journey. Then Neverwinter has to stop everything. Roland cracked a joke. Is it really good that the Minister of Industry is able to leave without saying a word? Don't you worry. Aside from the steam turbines, the few finished products to strengthen the piston engine, the factory is already in the production stage and at the most, the number of qualified products will drop slightly. Also, the Society of Wondrous Crafts members you've brought back are all talented. Letting them take over for a while isn't a bad thing. Wait a minute. Roland sensed something amiss. Anna had picked out all the plain and durable clothes, with not a single party dress or formal silk gown. There was not even a single skirt within them, and she did not appear to be joking. Where are you going? To the floating island, with you. She revealed a do you still need to ask expression. You're not planning to wait in Neverwinter for the outcome at the front lines, right? I can tell that you've made that decision after conversing with the three chiefs of Tequila. Furthermore, traveling to the bottomless land from the ridge of the continent is far more convenient, so that gives you more of a reason not to come back here. That won't do, Roland subconsciously denied her. Firstly, ignoring the fact of how this final battle with the demons will turn out, no one knows what is in the bottomless land. And Hacksword mentioned that the land there has been overrun by Skycy Realm, the risks are too much, you don't even know, smack. Anna extended both arms to gently slap his cheeks, then shake his head by force before caressing them. I know. And because of that, I'm going. Her voice was soft and gentle but Roland knew from one look in her eyes that she was accepting no as an answer. And in that instant, the image of her during their first encounter overlapped with her current appearance. At that time, Anna still had a trace of her nascency. She had nothing but her ability. Even so, her resolve once she made up her mind had always been difficult to change. Roland could only attempt one last time. You're different from the past. As queen, Leaving Neverwinter to take on this unnecessary risk is not the mature thing. If I am truly mature, I would not have agreed to let you go to the bottomless land without knowing anything about it at all. Anna pressed down on his shoulders, cutting him off. As to what would eventually happen to you, be it you failing or disappearing, all of them are possible outcomes. In other words, this final attack might possibly be our last time seeing each other again. Do you think I'm willing to stay in the city? Since everyone is taking the same risk, it isn't much for me to join. Roland knew that his last attempt had failed. After all, in a flipped situation, he would never be willing to wait alone. If we don't return, then it will be a situation so terrible that it can't get any worse, right? Anna released her hands and laughed. But even so, I will not regret it. Passing through the contorted black and white lines, Nightingale entered the empty office. With it so late at night, most people had already fallen asleep, leaving only a few flickering flames in the courtyard dancing to the night breeze. After drawing the curtains, she pulled open a drawer, taking the glowing magic stone and placing it into a light holder. Very quickly, the room was lit with a mild light. The broken teapot had been cleared long ago along with a replaced rug, as though the little incident had never occurred. Nightingale walked past the telephone table and found her target, a wooden case covered up by the messy files at the table head. In the mist, she could distinguish objects without light. In this unique domain that felt like a completely different world, it was forever in its monochrome state. Black, white, and gray constructed the entire world even without any light source. Except for this. She opened the case and it were filled with papers with scribbling written all over, and a few bright stones. 
Nightingale took one stone piece and placed it in her palm, then attempted to enter the mist. Just as the surging magic power took form, it immediately scattered, as though obstructed by something. As I've expected. She sighed as she placed the stone back into the case, feeling somewhat depressed. It was a report from the magic tower, if it wasn't not from Agatha or Selene, then it was from Isabella. But the possibility of it being written collectively by the three of them remained, the crisis of the deity of gods had just been resolved, but the red mist on the Hermes plateau had not dissipated completely. The tequila witches had to digest the findings and experiments done by the pure witches, thus, Isabella chose to temporarily live in Neverwinter. Together with the technology obtained from the demons, plenty of results were obtained, with a report due to be sent in the coming days. Typically, Roland would complete reading the report on the same day, but this day was an exception. With the separation of North Slope Mountain and the test flight of the huge plane arranged on the same day, Roland never had the opportunity to open the case. But Nightingale noticed the existence of the stone right from the beginning. After all, there were only two things that were not affected in the mist, one being magic power, and the second being the pure dark cavity formed by God's stones. According to Isabella's research, the two might even be connected. Thus, Nightingale had long noticed the black blob of light when Roland had met with Bonach Lothar, just that compared to a god's stone, its range of influence was on a much smaller scale, obviously a result from Isabella's alterations. As it was a specimen related to the report, she did not pay much heed to it. The small stone was the reason why Nightingale was unable to react when the teapot dropped, the black light shielded the falling teapot, and inside the mist, her body had deemed the situation irreversible. If it were merely so, Nightingale would have attributed it as an accident. However, she had seen a line that outlined a table being ejected upon her contact, passing through the blob of black light to collide with the teapot, ultimately altering the falling trajectory of the teapot. Distortions in the mist could not be controlled. Even she had to be careful around unsettled lines, otherwise, she might be the one to be severed. It was her first time witnessing such a thing. But Nightingale was unsure if it was a coincidence, or if something had changed within her. She attempted to manifest the ability again by touching the edge of the table in the mist repeatedly, mimicking the situation a couple of times but to no avail. Seems like I'm overthinking this. Nightingale awkwardly retracted her hand. Agatha's right, just because many of the witches are able to do it, I shouldn't assume that evolving is a simple thing. Fortunately for me, I hadn't said anything, otherwise Roland would have made fun of me. She put the glowing magic stone back into the drawer and departed the office by retracing her steps. Crack. The room that had regained its silence suddenly produced a soft sound. At the table side that was hidden from sight, a crack blossomed along the wood grain. Chapter 1450, Tequila Street Battle Days later, south of the Furl Plains, Tower Station No. 10, Balsham lay prone outside the turret, looking at the silhouette of the ancient city a distance away. She had once read a report in the weekly newspaper about the Northern Expedition. She knew it was once the famous witch city in history, Tequila. In order to conquer it, demons went to great lengths, but were ultimately sent retreating by the First Army. And now, they were here to defeat new enemies, so as to recapture Tequila. One minute. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. As she counted silently in her head, she covered her ears. Boom. 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 The cannon's booming sounded behind her. The continuous reverberations transmitted to the vehicles through the ground as she felt her arms turn slightly numb. They were the 152 mm long song cannon of the artillery squad which were raining metal on the target. Compared to the short barrel cannon on the tank, they were on two completely different levels. Team leader, haven't you gotten used to the cannon booms? The driver, Bay, turned his head and quipped. He sat cross-legged in the front area of the vehicle, and even in a battlefield strewn with corpses and the stench of rotting demonic beasts wafting through it, he continued consuming his meal. That won't do. You need to learn how to let your ears filter out the unimportant noises. 
only then can you constantly maintain your focus. To me, you just have a poor sense of hearing. Balshan cast her sight away emotionlessly. Although the driver and the cannoneer were veteran soldiers with rich experience, according to the rules, the vehicle commander was the leader of the team. Besides, in terms of age, it was even possible that she was older than the both of them. The only thing I need to listen out for is any abnormal sounds from the sigil of screaming, not the sound of cannons or your nonsense, get it? Team leader. What you said is a little harsh. Bay smacked his lips. I thought a witch would be sweet and adorable, just like Angel Mana. Five years ago, witches were the devil's minions, the embodiment of evil. Ah, no one will like you if you act this way. What nonsense. I think team leader's pretty good, Kanonir sure interjected. She's straightforward and capable. She has never had any military experience, but she's able to adapt to the battlefield in such a short amount of time. She's the best choice of being vehicle commander. Both of them looked at Shur. The latter was stunned. Why? Did I say something wrong? No. Balshan shrugged. Although you missed nine out of ten shots during training, you don't seem completely inept. The cannoneer revealed a look of pleasure. Enough, enough. Let's not talk about this any further. They hurriedly switched topics. By the way, team leader, back at tower station number nine, who was the person waiting outside the camp for you? He seemed to be wearing a first army uniform as well. Is he your friend? Why are you asking about this? Bay said, a little embarrassed, I saw a medal hanging off his chest and wished to get to know him. Being awarded a medal isn't an easy task. He must be someone impressive. I do know him, but he's not that impressive. Without me, he would probably have been food for the demonic beasts. Balshan feigned indifference, but her tone slowed down significantly. Wow, your standards are way too high. Before he finished his sentence, she covered her ears again. It was another deafening salvo. Bay, who wasn't prepared at all, curled his lips from the rumbling boom. And after these booms, three green flares flew into the sky, a signal for attacking. It doesn't seem like your focus is that focused either. Balshan patted the steel plate by the side of the turret. Convoy 12, set off immediately. Bay didn't provide a rejoinder. Instead, he threw the canister in his hand away and rushed from the driver's seat to the back of the vehicle. Schur also went into the cramped turret and prepared for battle. Regardless of how it was typically, none of them showed any sense of carelessness at critical moments. Balshan raised her telescope and saw that under the assault of the artillery, many demonic beasts were fleeing from the ruins and heading north. In turning to look back, the first army had split into dozens of tiny teams and were advancing steadily behind the tracks of tanks. Such a formation clearly wasn't used to deal with hybrids. The deeper they were into the plains, the more blade beasts they would encounter. It went from one every two to three days to several in a day. Due to the difficulty in detecting them with the naked eye, they were harder to deal with compared to the typical demonic beast. Without a doubt, the strategy provided by the upper echelons of the military was effective. Sigil of Screaming and Sigil of Resonance would discover the targets beyond the range of short-barreled cannons and then annihilate them. However, the enemy appeared to be nothing as simple as pure wild beasts. They knew how to conceal themselves and launch a surprise assault on the troops. Cannon fire was able to frighten away the demonic beasts, but it was unable to frighten away the blade beasts. As such, recapturing the railway's strongholds took quite a lot of work for everyone. After paying a certain price, the First Army rapidly established a battle strategy with armor troops at its core. Originally, the flintlock troops would treat tanks as scouts, but now, they learned how to rely on them to clear out the enemy. And the tequila ruins in front of them was to date, the most complicated battlefield that wasn't in the wild. Half an hour later, as one of the vanguards, Convoy 12 drove into Tequila. To Balshan's side were Convoys 9 and 17. According to the plan, they were responsible for clearing the main street that led to the Western Square and reacquired the two fortresses that were established there. After studying her surroundings, Balshan could not help but feel her scalp tingle. 
many stone buildings made the situation in the city extremely complex. Even the sigil of screaming's detection range was greatly reduced. She now had to rely on listening to various magic power sources, but was ultimately unable to determine the target's exact location. How did you guys take down this place previously? Simple. As long as you get rid of the red mist towers and those skeletons, the demons would naturally retreat, Sure replied. Have you found the enemy? Not yet. But I am certain that there are many monsters hiding in this city. After saying that, Balshan gestured to the soldiers behind her, requesting that they stayed closer to the tank. This also resulted in them opening a gap with the other two convoys. Shortly after, a grey cement fortress appeared at the end of the street. Although the first army was forced to abandon it, the solid construction was not damaged by the enemy. At this moment, the sound of the sigil of screaming intensified clearly. Balshan frowned. That wasn't the sound a blade beast should have. She looked towards the vehicle commander of Convoy 9, Amy. The latter shook her head, indicating that she was confounded as well. And when they drove past the fortress, the sigil's hums were so loud that even Bay could hear it. For precautionary reasons, she made the two vehicle convoys stop temporarily. She planned on heading to the square alone and bring along the sigil of resonance which had been activated. Even if the target wasn't a blade beast, she wanted to see where the source of magic power pointed. Soon, a glow appeared out of thin air, pointing to the middle of the nearby square, but there was nothing there. Could it be that she had encountered a new type of invisible enemy? That's not right. Balshan quickly discovered that the bricks on the surface of the square seemed to have been pried away. There were signs of black corrosion in the vicinity. That thing was hiding underground. The moment she had that thought, the soil underneath the bricks suddenly rose. A monster formed of ribs and flesh and blood crawled out from underground, spewing out a pile of transparent bodies. If not for the sticky mucus that remained on those things, Balshan wouldn't have been able to detect them. Almost at the same time, the sigil of screaming released a loud warning. She suddenly came to the realization that all those things were blade beasts. Chapter 1451 The Secret to Having Good Aim Get back now! Balshan crouched down and roared, sure, fire straight ahead. Understood, taking aim, stop aiming, just fire. She pulled open the gun bolt and turned towards the monster, momentarily forgetting to tune the sigil of resonance. As the vehicle reversed, the 75mm short barrel eventually spewed flames. The 300 meters distance between the vehicle and monster was covered in the blink of an eye. The instant sure opened fire, a pillar of smoke appeared on the bloodied monster. It looked like a miss but the trio caught sight of the falling limbs amidst the twirling smoke. Despite the small caliber of the cannon, it was still a cannon and not something a machine gun could compare to. From the dust cloud formed, Balshan roughly estimated more than ten outlines of blade beasts. This monster is carrying a bunch of blade beasts. At this time, Bay finally reacted. That's right, I'm afraid that this is the Sky Sea Realm's nest mother mentioned in the manual, Balshan replied, but there were too many differences as compared to the illustration, as though the one in front of them was a mutated species. Retreating back to the corner of the street, the other two convoys had noticed the commotion. Before Balshan could speak up, Amy started screaming. The other tank team is less than two streets west of us, it'll only take five minutes to meet up with them. No, don't go, it's too late. Balshan screamed at the top of her lungs. Let the soldiers enter the fortress. You want us to meet the enemy head on here? There's more than one of them. The vehicle commander of Convoy 17, Hero, revealed an expression of shock. It's precisely because there are more than one of them, so we can't retreat. Despite the severity of the situation, Balshan's mind was extremely clear. Just the three tanks were definitely insufficient and incapable of stopping more than ten blade beasts. If they were allowed to charge into the soldiers, the loss would be irrevocable. But they were different, as Isabella had mentioned, the armored weapons they were in were basically capable of offense and defense by design. 
even if they were surrounded by the enemy, it did not determine the outcome of the battle. Hero, please seal that passageway. Only by doing so can we let loose and fight. The latter turned and looked at the corroded and deformed steel doors of the fortress and immediately understood her intent. I understand. Amy, follow behind me. Air. Fine, all right. Although Balshan was not the commanding officer of the team, Amy nodded her head subconsciously. Team leader, you're really. Too cool. Sure added respectfully. You can bootlick me after everyone returns safely. Balshan grinned. She knew that doing so wasn't that great an idea, but was unable to control herself. She didn't hate Dusk, but there was nothing interesting at all during the period in which she accompanied her at the developing areas. She could not lie to herself, while being chased after by the church, she had assumed that a quiet life was her goal, but from the looks of it, she was more suited for the smoke and flames on the battlefield. Maybe this is the reason why I awakened as a combat witch. After the soldiers were safe in the fortress, Convoy 17 revved the engine and reversed towards the doors at full speed. With a loud bang, the tank inserted itself straight into the wall, forming a blockhouse fixed in place. By doing so, the invisible assassins of the Sky Sea Realm were no longer able to pass through the steel barrier and attack the relatively weaker soldiers. At this moment, blade beasts appeared several hundred meters away on the road. Despite being unable to actually see them, Balshan was able to mark out their locations with the magic power lines produced by the Sigil of Resonance. Straight ahead at full speed, don't stop. She roared and dived straight into the turret, sealing the entrance to it. The war machine not only had its cannons and machine guns to kill its enemies, but its massive bulk itself proved to be extremely fatal as long as it maintained a certain speed. While stepping on the gas pedal, Balsham looked into the side mirror and suddenly noticed a magic power line that extended into the air. Wait, those monsters can fly? That's not right. She quickly reacted. The enemy had pounced high into the sky over a large distance. She held onto the armrest tightly as her entire body stretched perfectly straight. Whether or not I live or die depends on the workmanship of the Neverwinter artisans. Bang! The enemy smashed heavily onto the top of the vehicle with an impact so massive it formed a small depression on the metal plate, along with a reverberating sound that caused the trio's eardrums to go numb. Even so, the vehicle merely shook and did not show even the slightest amount of stop or reduction in speed. Balshan immediately felt emboldened. I'll take charge of aiming. She turned the turret while commanding, you only need to pull the trigger. Then what about me? Bay asked. The goal is that monster, so long as you do not crash into the wall, you're free to drive however you like. Balshan ignored the pouncing enemies knowing that her comrades would deal with them. If the bloody monster was truly a nest mother, it was their first priority to eliminate it, otherwise, the number of blade beasts on the ground would only increase. Amid the rumbling of the magic cube power unit, the tank braved through the crowd of blade beasts. The coaxial machine guns spewed bullets fervently, causing substantial damage on the blade beasts that did not wield barrier abilities like senior demons. When the damage done was fatal on critical spots, it was enough to cause the target to fall during its pounce. Although they were not dead, the steel caterpillar tracks completed the job. The blade beasts were only capable of impaling through the tank's steel plates when their front blades blossomed with blue light, but this move exposed themselves to the scope of the machine guns. Under the circumstances that they were unable to harm one another, Amy had evidently used Balshan as a target with the majority of Convoy 9's bullets focused on the sides of the Balshan's vehicle. Very quickly, the two tanks tore a path through the enemy, with piles of badly mutilated corpses left all around the tracks. When their vitality ceased, the confusing invisibility stopped functioning, revealing all the weak points located at the bottom part of the blade beasts. Balshan's tank was equally as worn out with the machine gun gone and a few large holes on the large vehicle that allowed black blood to leak inside. The closest the enemy had reached was a stab that was merely a few inches from her, to the point that she was able to feel the burning magic power from the tip of the blade. But the greatest difference between machine and biological life forms was that even with all the bruises, the tank's performance never dropped. 
it maintained its full speed across the plaza, while the enemy's pulverized internal organs served as a lubricant for the wheels. The nest mother might have sensed the situation turn against it as it started to turn and flee. However, the huge body moved in a manner that could be fully described as clumsy. They were not in the swirling sea after all. What is the most crucial factor to having a good aim? Balshan asked. Being close enough, sure replied seriously. Then you better don't miss. Bay shouted loudly as he controlled the tank towards its target as it suddenly thrust into the enemy's ribs. The monster unleashed an ear-piercing roar. From the position of the cannoneer, their entire vision was the target. Sure pulled the trigger without hesitation. The 75mm howitzer unleashed its high explosive shell that penetrated into the monster's body, almost running through the entire body and exploded at the head. Chapter 1452 The Deviating Skysy Realm A minute later, another tank squadron rushed over to the intersection of Convoy 12's and Convoy 9's battlefield. Amy, Balshan, are you guys all right? The leader, Ify, shouted from afar. Balshan waved her hand to indicate that she was fine, while Amy shouted back excitedly. Why are you here? We just got rid of a large fella. Wasn't it because of the loud cannon booms? Ify finally relaxed after seeing that the two were unharmed. She jumped down the tank and quickly walked over to the monster's body that had experienced having a high explosive shell tear through its body, and asked in shock. What is this? It should be a nest mother, but honestly, I'm not too sure, Balshan muttered. It could be said that the discharge had been delivered cleanly, not only were the internal organs completely destroyed, even the head had been blasted off. Of course, whether or not the monster had a head was a different question altogether, since according to logic, living creatures would not flee while running backwards. The magic power within the monster dissipated subsequently causing it to turn into its meat pulp state the instant the body collapsed. The only thing left standing were the two rows of completely damaged ribs. Are you sure this is a nest mother? Ify fished out her manual and compared them with a frown. The bone structure seems similar, but it seems smaller, and there aren't many tentacles. Right, have you seen the eyes inside its body? The enormous compound eye was the nest mother's most prominent feature. According to the manual, it was more or less the same size as the nest mother's internal organs and situated right in the center. It was impossible to miss. Balshan shook her head. I guess that she was the nest mother, only because it was able to carry many blade beasts. As for everything else, I'm as confused as you are. But. She paused for a moment. Ignoring the nest mother, all the monsters here differ slightly from all the ones stated in the manual. If you don't believe me, look at that dead blade beasts, if he then realized that the peculiarities on the blade beast corpses around the nest mother. Are those? Wings? That's right, Balshan answered. It looks as light and thin as a cicada's wings, but much larger in size. Using these wings, they were able to pounce across large distances, that is something unprecedented. I sort of understand why the higher-ups wants us to retrieve intact Skysy Realm specimens. If he sighed after staring at the corpses for a long time. Their rate of evolution and variation is too astonishing. That is a question the higher-ups have to consider. Balshan climbed up her tank and gestured to Ify. As for us, we just have to destroy them. The report of the First Army reclaiming the Tequila Ruins quickly arrived at Roland's office. In this city battle, the demonic beasts were no longer the main enemies. This was the first large-scale appearance of the Sky Sea Realm and the majority of the threat were from the Blade Beasts. But compared to the previous time when a single or two Blade Beasts were enough to thwart the troops' defense line, the outcome could be said to be completely different. The newly commissioned armor unit displayed its decisive effectiveness in battle, not only by locking down the enemy's position but also winning most of the battles. The First Army paid an extremely small price to eliminate most of the Sky Sea Realm's presence, and gained a stable foothold on the Fertile Plains. Amongst the achievements, Convoys 12 and 9 had eliminated a nest mother as well as over 10 blade beasts together while coming out unscathed, 
which completely overhauled how the army perceived battles. Aside from asserting details of the battle, the remaining report were related to applying for an increase in production of the tanks. Even with insufficient witches, the army was willing to allow ordinary officers to take command of the vehicles. Obviously, they had tasted the benefits of having the heavy armor with all-encompassing offense and defense capabilities. Roland was not surprised by the outcome, the title of being the king of ground battles was established from the two world wars, declaring the importance and weight of tanks in battles. If not for that, he would not have transferred a team to specially learn how to pilot the vehicles during the early phase of producing the tractors. Compared to this matured weapon, Roland was more concerned over the monster corpses being delivered back by trains. At noon time, Agatha's phone call came. It was regarding the preliminary verdict on the dissection and analysis of the corpses. Upon entering the Magic Tower's lower levels, a cold breeze welcomed Roland. A pile of large ice cubes were arranged in an orderly manner inside the large basement. People unaware would assume that the place was an ice storage, but Roland knew that the ice cubes were frozen Skysea Realm corpses transported back from the front lines for the Witch Union to research. The dissecting area was located in the center of the room, where Agatha removed her gloves and performed the Union's hand salute to him. You seem happy, Roland tightened his collar and commented. Because I'm back to my old job again. Agatha smiled. To be honest, the ice-cold laboratory still suits me best. Representing Tequila's expeditions, all those political meets and conferences aren't my strengths. With regards to the best representative of the ancient witches, Pasha was obviously the most suitable, but moving the carrier's large body was mostly inconvenient, thus Agatha was rationally chosen as the second best candidate. Seeing Roland's desire to express himself but at a loss for words, the ice witch took the initiative and waved her hand. Relax, your majesty, the battle of divine will takes precedence, I understand that. He nodded and focused on the pressing issues at hand. What did you discover? Your majesty, please take a look here. Agatha condensed an ice blade at her fingertips and pricked into a large organ. This was retrieved from the new nest mother, I found distinct signs of age in its interior. Likewise, I haven't seen such a thing on any of the blade beasts. Signs of age? Roland frowned. He noticed that there was a clear dark blotch of creases at where the ice blade was. That's right. Magic power is capable of strengthening the magic user's body, something proven on witches and demons, so naturally the Skysy realm will not be an exception. And the most obvious indicator of the physical enhancement is an increased life expectancy, Agatha explained in detail. I have consulted the reports supplied by the demons, and there are no clear mentions of how long nest mothers can survive. On the contrary, it does state that blade beasts and the other beasts do not have long life expectancy. Even though they die fast, the nest mothers are able to breed new beasts quickly. You mean to say, that the situation here is reversed? Nightingale spoke up. Could it be that this nest mother is old? If it was a single case, it would be hard to tell. But we received four corpses from the front lines, and I found similarities in all cases. This cannot be a coincidence, Agatha replied. And you've come across a nest mother yourself and know how big they are. In terms of size, all of these monsters that are less than 10 meters long do not look as though they've hit their prime. That's true. And regardless of the wings they use to pounce or the increasingly larger sides, everything is going against their past characteristics. She turned and looked at Roland. Your Majesty, I do not think that these things are the same as their old counterparts, those that reside freely in the water. So your conclusion is? Roland's expression became solemn. I'm afraid that the nest mothers are moving their own magic power onto their servants to create even stronger sources of troops. Agatha enunciated each and every word. It is just that their evolution is deviating away from the ocean, to the extent that I can say that they are sacrificing the future of their species. Roland sighed. But that means we are in trouble. Chapter 1453 Shadow of Blackstone Region To the north of the Fertile Plains 
Since leaving Neverwinter, Lightning and Maggie had continued their flight for close to ten straight days. They patrolled across the plains cruising over hundreds of kilometers at an economic speed, where their magic power recovered through the night able to sustain a day's use. The two only dropped to the ground when they needed to camp or hunt. The current exploration group had entered a new phase, although they held the latest maps provided by the Union, the centuries of vicissitudes that constituted desolate paths, dried canals, abandoned cities that were overwhelmed with weed and shrub, made them useless to locate road signs. The only things that guided them directionally were the stars in the sky and the large ridge of the continent in the distance. And at such a distance, the sigil of listening no longer broadcast messages, leaving the bird and the girl alone in the vast lands. The sense of desolation and solitude was a large barrier to adventuring, and without the company of her trusted companion Maggie, Lightning did not know if she could persist for long. The purpose of the journey was clear, to confirm the location and route of the demon's new deity of gods, as well as illuminate the plains beyond Tequila. Even so, looking for a floating island in the vast lands was not an easy mission. To lessen the exhaustion of the vein, the enemy city would not be flying at a high height, and might possibly be clinging close to the ground. This way, the deity of gods would resemble any small mountain from a distance, and they had to get up close to verify the target through red mist, provided that the weather permitted it. So as to avoid brushing past the deity of gods, lightning chose to fly in broken paths with the edge being the ridge of the continent. Grr. Suddenly, the stomach of the gray eagle flying above grumbled. You're hungry again? Lightning looked up. Oh. Maggie nodded. But you didn't even move much, how are you hungrier than me so much earlier? Because I've been staring at the ground, A-O-O. She leaned over and rubbed lightning on the cheeks. The eyes and brains are connected, and according to the book, using the brain is most exhausting, oh. Wait a minute, that's not what was written in Theoretical Foundations of Natural Science. The paragraph clearly stated that even while stationary, the brain's energy consumption remains the highest out of all the organs in the body, that doesn't mean that a moving person isn't using their brains. But the itch on her cheeks prevented lightning from flying properly, leaving her no choice but to slow down and head towards the ground. From the color of the sky, they were only able to fly for another half hour at most, so stopping earlier to rest was not an issue. Additionally, they had few jerkies left on hand, thus making use of the additional time to restock was not a bad idea. Of course, the most important thing was her being unable to refuse the adorable Maggie. Same rules. You hunt and I'll make the fire. Use the sigil of listening for contact in the case of any emergencies, understand? Got it, oh. Before her voice trailed off, Maggie was already up in the air in the form of a devil beast. Without a choice, Lightning looked for shelter and prepared dinner. With Roland's technological advancements, flints, firewool, and torches, tools that were needed for adventuring were replaced by compact and intricate products. For example, the windproof matches that was the size of half a palm, the single-use torchlights, as well as the multifunctional knife that every member of the exploration group adored. All of these items could be stored in a pocket, and because of that, the majority of space in her bag were replaced with all sorts of spices and condiments. If they had time, they were even able to produce a full table of dishes. There were times that even Lightning remained unclear whether or not she was better at adventuring or had a talent towards being a gourmet. It was most probably related to Maggie becoming hungry so often. What followed proceeded in a systematic structure, Maggie quickly brought a bison back and used her sharp talons to slice it into pieces. Lightning chose the best parts, and either smoked or baked them in mud. The two had repeated the process countless times and their coordination had become smooth and natural. By the time the fire had died out, they were not only full but had restocked their haversack of jerkies. It was as though everything had been reset to the moment before they set off. The only difference was their progress, and maybe their objective for the trip. Any little bit of a guilty conscience was quickly replaced with food coma. After laying out the sigil of screaming, Lightning burrowed into the sleeping bag with Maggie and quickly fell asleep. The next morning, when she opened her eyes in reverie, she surprisingly discovered an additional shadow that loomed in the distance. 
Lightning rubbed her eyes in confusion. The land was a flat plain the day before and they had verified the surrounding topography. It was impossible for them to have missed out the small hill. After spending a few good minutes in her drowsy reverie, she held her breath and took a good look again. This time, she was taken aback. Through the thin morning mist, the hilltop was unexpectedly flat, completely unlike any natural landform. The shocking thing was that it actually became larger in a few short minutes, which meant that the shadow was approaching them. Lightning knew what the moving hill on the fertile plains was. She shook Maggie up in disbelief. Peck me once. Coo. The latter raised her forefingers and poked lightning on the forehead. The pain immediately cleared up her mind. It was no hallucination. Right at this moment, a gust of wind swept past the two and sent Maggie's long, white hair fluttering. Along with the wind came a thin mist. In that instant, the shadow revealed its true form. On the triangular black mountain form stood a gigantic pyramid structure formed completely of black stone its sheer size and bulk difficult to fathom. If the old deity of God's center was the demon city, then this pyramid itself was able to hold the entire city on it. This form was most probably the reason for the lack of red mist. One large and one smaller inverted alls made the floating island look extremely oppressive. Compared to the first deity of gods that had the resemblance of a mountain range, the new deity of gods looked completely unnatural. Be it the structured exterior or the symmetrical form, the entire structure manifested the power of the demons. Who would have thought that the second deity of gods they were looking for had appeared right before them? Without even packing their sleeping gear, lightning pulled Maggie and soared into the sky. After the continuous ascension, the sight behind the demon city gradually revealed itself. Numerous densely packed black dots rushed forth on the plains like a turbulent wave, amongst which were countless alternating red lines, forming a cloth that devoured everything in its path with the black dots. Lightning gulped. If the black dots were all demons, their numbers were more than the human population of the four kingdoms combined. It was without a doubt the enemy's main force in motion. Chapter 1454, Take Off the investigation group immediately sent news back to Neverwinter. It's really like the entire nest is out. After listening to Lightning's report, Roland sighed. This would undoubtedly be the first direct collision between both races and might even be the last. Regardless of the outcome, it determined the future for both humanity and demons. Can we? Win? Lightning asked with hesitation. She was dirty from head to toe. Her hair ends tangled and unruly, with the smell of sour sweat lingering on. Obviously, after finding out about the demons, she had rushed back without any rest at all. Of course. Roland acted relaxed and patted her shoulders. Not only will we win, but we will enjoy a clean and decisive victory. It was evident that the demons held the undisputed advantage in terms of numbers, but this also showed just how much pressure the Sky Sea Realm had placed on them. The First Army's technology had its own advantages, but since they could not afford to fight in a battle of attrition, it would be a Pyrrhic victory if the demons entered the Four Kingdoms. By the same logic, even if the demons won, it was inevitable that they would suffer a tremendous loss. Roland believed that the best outcome was an internecine one if the demons were not stopped to the west of the impassable mountain range. Lightning heaved a slight sigh of relief, then suddenly became embarrassed. Air. Do I smell? Weird? Roland chucked. A bit. But it is the smell of adventure, so it's nothing bad. He deliberately pinched his nose. To be honest, I think it isn't bad. The girl's face flushed red, immediately grabbing Maggie, who was sniffing down her collar, before rushing out of the office with her head lowered. I, I'm going to take a bath. Coo? Maggie remained confused. Lightning, Maggie. Just as the two were leaving, Roland called out to them. It was tough on both of you, have a good rest. Yes. Once the door closed, he immediately grabbed the phone and called the administrative office. Notify the cabinet for a meeting, the time to set off is here. Inside the meeting room, the higher-ups of Neverwinter sat in a circle. 
Roland pasted Lightning's hand-drawn map behind him and repeated the exploration group's findings. There are two verifiable points from this information, one being the existence of the new deity of gods located less than 300 kilometers away from the ridge of the continent and continuously moving north. The second point is that it is bringing along a large number of demons to the extent that the new floating island is incapable of accommodating all of them, therefore, they are resorting to such an inefficient method of movement. I think it isn't difficult to comprehend the former, to infiltrate Everwinter in the kingdom of Wolfheart, the demon army not only built an obelisk in the middle of the ridge of the continent, but they have even established a supply line through the land of dawn. By flying along the mountain range, not only does it prevent a deviation in course, but they are also able to ease the burden of red mist by using the supply line. It is considered a rather reliable route. The latter isn't clear in the sense of the specific quantity, but since their full strength is out, I expect that the demons capable of battle numbers is around 10 million without any exaggeration. According to their current progress, we can expect them to arrive at the edge of the four kingdoms in half a month. Upon the mention of numbers, Roland noticed the fear shown on many of their faces. But it could not be blamed, after going through two battle of divine wills, humanity had suffered terribly and the survivors did not even reach 10 million, not to mention their weakened army. To Berev and the others, the scale of 10 million was no different from an astronomical figure. This enemy attack is one whereby they have cut off their means of retreat, and also a battle that will determine the fate of humanity. The Eleanor Skycruiser must move out immediately to rush to as close as possible to the impassable mountain range and stop the enemy's advancement northwards. But, Your Majesty, Berev said with much difficulty, the enemy has an astonishing population, while the force the floating island can bring is limited. Is taking the initiative to meet the attack too risky? Holding the ground at Grey Castle is what's most risky. Edith stood up and gave the old director a glance. Everybody, do not be intimidated by ten million demons. If they are unable to reach Grey Castle, their numbers mean nothing. You will understand just by thinking about it, the Blackstone region had that many demons since the first battle of divine will. The reason for their inability to travel all the way here in the past was because of the red mist supply line. So our true target is only one thing, the enemy's floating city. Once her reasoning was out, the atmosphere in the room changed ever so lightly, since no one was willing to admit their fear of the enemy. That's right, Roland suppressed a laugh and added. Once they lose their supply of red mist, the demons in the fertile plains will have difficulty inching forward. Additionally, us setting out now isn't an indication that we are going into battle, we will be using this time en route to allow the army to have sufficient time to prepare. There was an additional point that he did not say, Skylord and Silent Disaster who returned to Sky City to bring together the troops. Since the demon's movement used the supply line at the western front, it was impossible for Haxord to be unable to know of the new location of King City. To the king of the demon race, Haxord was a complete traitor, so him amassing more strength was the best way for self-preservation. The fall of the king's city would undoubtedly be his best opportunity, and Haxord would not remain indifferent at that time. Upon thinking about this, Roland turned to Tilly. Right, how's the takeoff and landing training going for the aerial knights? Far easier than I had imagined, Tilly replied. There isn't much difference from landing and taking off on the ground. As long as the weather permits, the students are able to accomplish their tasks with ease. The only trouble is that we previously only had to use the impassable mountain range or the shoreline for the pilots to roughly determine their location and from there, find the landing site. But from here on out, the enemy and us will be constantly on the move. Adding the lack of direction that the Furl Plains provides, I'm afraid that there will be difficulty locating our point of departure. Of course, it isn't an unsolvable problem, you only need to supply us with more fuel. This was also a difficult problem for aircraft carriers in combat, in a battlefield that spanned over a few hundred kilometers, any tiny divergence would accumulate to form a large error. The fortunate thing was that compared to the unvarying ocean, there were bound to be some reference objects on dry land that could be used to determine their location, for example, forests, rivers, mountain peaks etc. 
Roland was able to guess at her plans, if the pilots were unskilled with the maneuvering, they had to train more and fly more. Naturally, they would learn to be more aware of their own locations. Relax, they will be able to fly for as long as you want them to, he promised. In the upcoming battle, the aerial knights were without question the main fighting force. It was also because of this aerial force that mankind had the opportunity to attack and stop the demons a thousand miles from home. Seeing that no one else had any objections, Roland surveyed the hall once more and gave the order. With that, I shall announce the commencement of Phase 3 of the Heaven Plan. We shall set off on the floating island, and the target is the northern regions of the Fertile Plains. Chapter 1455 Pioneer. Two days later, the Eleanor Skycruiser completed its final resupply at a cliff pier, rose to the sky, and flew towards the land of Don Hinderland. A hundred thousand citizens from Neverwinter were present to send it off, the crowds flooded the streets, climbed the roofs, and even ascended the impassable mountain ranges, just to witness this historic moment. The entire western side of the city was filled with people, once again setting a new record for the number of people attending an activity. And that was just a portion of Neverwinter's population. There were even more people working at the factories, port, and farmlands, every one of them participating in a way for the expedition. It was coincidentally the same day when the border area and Longsong District's total population broke through the million mark, with more than 50% of the source coming from the Kingdom of Wolfheart and Everwinter. Although they were unlike the initial migrants that harbored negative emotions towards Neverwinter, everyone was able to sense the shock from the surge of people, as well as the common consensus that the day was extraordinarily meaningful. Following the loud booms from the ceremonial cannons, the Eleanor Skycruiser traveled parallel to the mountains and moved towards Longsong Stronghold before turning west. It moved steadily into the distance, and finally disappeared from everyone's sight. But the elevated atmosphere among the citizens did not stop there. Greycastle Weekly's tracking reports caused the sales volume to reach an all-time high, and everywhere on the streets, the topics discussed lingered around the topic of this attack. Gradually, the day of the departure became widely known as Miracle Day, representing humanity's new beginning of conquering the skies. This was the second event to be hailed as a miracle after the Miracle Building. However, it was much quieter on the floating island. After the initial enthusiasm passed, the engineering team dedicated themselves to the tense but orderly work. It was the same with the aerial knights as well, aside from the routine flights conducted by the detection squad. All the students took flight at least once a day to familiarize themselves with the surrounding terrain. The large floating island, the busy runway, and the thick smoke from the furnace area formed a rather distinct and unique scene. How does it feel? Are you able to adapt to your new body? In the core region of the floating island, Roland stood at the bottom of the mine and looked at Eleanor, who was firmly tied to the god stone pillar. In the past month, not only did the pillar become bigger, the mother of soul had even grown more tentacles and dug them into the soil beneath like the roots of a plant. According to her logic, the tentacles were additional perceptive organs for her, providing her better control over the island. In a sense, the island was the body and the tentacles were the nerves. Much better compared to before. Eleanor's voice was much lighter and casual as well. I can see, I can hear, I can think. How can I be dissatisfied with that? Compared to Elena and the others, I am considered extremely fortunate already. Lady Chief, don't say that, Pasha lowered her main tentacle and replied. Everyone knows that if not for your choice to merge, we would never have survived. Furthermore, you didn't know that this day would come. This act of bravery is already enough to, I'm talking about the outcome and not the process, Eleanor interrupted her. I believe that I wasn't the only one who was willing to sacrifice for the Union. My other sisters would as well. I merely was first. Seems like she's doing well, Roland thought to himself. He had his worries previously. As a witch, she had fought against the demons for decades, and he was afraid that she would ultimately turn into a demon herself. But by the looks of it, Eleanor was extremely mature and did not worry about the form of her body at all. I know what you're thinking. Eleanor suddenly turned her attention back to him. 
you were afraid that I couldn't get over it and become depressed and reclusive? If I were the only person left in the world, that might have happened. But with basically everyone here and the state of the war far better than how it was four centuries ago, and with so much new knowledge that requires studying, where do I have the time or effort to act like that? Air. Studying? For the Union to become the rulers of humanity, it does not rely only on abilities. Back then, we were equipped with the most advanced technology and ideas. Similarly for us, calling it three representatives isn't an exaggeration either. Although the Union's glory no longer exists, I still have to rely on studying and learning to keep up with the current generation's progress. Roland was speechless. The familiar terms used by her were clearly picked up from the God's punishment witches. God knew what they were teaching her. And what have you learned up to now? College level, Eleanor replied. Almost at the graduation phase. Previously, we had Celine, Ling, and the others to guide and teach Lady Eleanor, but now, Lady Eleanor is the one teaching them, Pasha added with a laugh. Wait, she just woke up less than two months ago and she's already finished with a college curriculum? Roland clicked his tongue. Before, he did not attach importance when Eleanor forced Mask away, and it was only then did he realize that he had underestimated the learning ability of dozens of brains. By the way, I made a miniature core apparatus that might help us in the following battles. With Eleanor's consent, Pasha pulled out a frame the size of a palm and placed it on the palm. It floated silently and produced a dazzling blue luster at its center, just like gigantic magic power cores. What is it capable of? Roland asked. It is able to imitate, to a certain extent, telekinetic powers, and is able to influence foreign objects. For example the rotation of handles and the pressing of triggers, etc. If it is combined with a specific machinery, I can control the machinery using magic power, Eleanor explained. Although Mask had taken away all mobility features of this body, he did not seal the use of the magic power completely. It means that when enemies come, I am able to operate weapons and engage in battle myself. The theory involved is somewhat similar to the automatic weapons in the dream world. Roland gaped in shock. And that wasn't all as she continued, in a sense, firing a gun can be considered computational, something that I am proficient in. Compared to an ordinary soldier, I am able to increase the effective hit rate of firearms to 90% within their effective maximum range. The shortfall is that I am unable to move nimbly and need to match the firearm with a gun turret, and also have to position my tentacles in the miniature core beforehand. But at the very least, the weapon turrets will become highly effective while defending the island. How many can you control at once? That depends on how many tentacles I have. She paused for a while. I'm guessing a few hundred. Upon thinking of the scene whereby a few hundred machine gun turrets, or even cannons, were controlled by Eleanor to fire at the enemy, Roland almost smacked his lips. But this was not the reason for his lament. What he cared about was Eleanor's combination of magic power and machinery. The knowledge of both aspects came from Mask Nasapel as well as the dream world. Not only did she absorb the knowledge, she had also taken the initiative to combine them. If given additional time, how much change would she bring to the world? If this mission hadn't required the use of the floating island, I would never have thought of sending you personally into battle. Roland revealed his thoughts. What humans are lacking the most at present is guidance in this direction. Oh? You're not afraid that my understanding of these things will exceed yours? It sounded as though Eleanor was giggling. Lady Eleanor. Pasha wanted to stop Eleanor, but she did not know how to phrase her sentence. Why should I be afraid? Roland returned with a question. It is extremely normal for successors to surpass their predecessors. This signifies continuous progress in a civilization. If humanity's knowledge is limited by me, that is when I will consider our future bleak. The other party remained silent for a moment before speaking up again. You are truly not qualified to be a king. But, you are definitely worthy of being hailed as a trustworthy leader. Chapter 1456, A Future With You After spreading her blanket, 
Nightingale turned around and blew out the candle flame. The room immediately darkened. She found it amusing that after being accustomed to lights and magic stones, she was slightly uncomfortable returning to using candles, despite it being a normal occurrence in the past. But there was not a choice in this matter, the lack of time prevented the island from having a complete electrical lighting system installed, to the extent that even their resting places were drilled out of a wall by Afra and the rest. Soraya then added a soft layer and isolated the moisture of the underground chambers and made the place into a bedroom. The furniture within were the most ordinary, with simple wooden tables and cabinets. As for the mattresses, they were laid directly on the floor. Although Isabella was on the floating island, all the magic stone illuminations were used for the factories rushing to produce goods. It would take her some time to transform God's stone for the residential areas. Despite the simplicity of the room, it was not unbearable. Aside from the privacy of having a room per person, there were even standalone toilets. There were even ventilation shafts that provided airflow directly from outside the floating island into the chambers preventing the rooms from being too stuffy or humid. There was a shared reading area and a warm public bath at the end of the caves as well, enough to satisfy the witch's daily use. She wasn't that interested in the former, but Nightingale found the latter wonderful. God knows how Pasha and the others had found the location, the stream that came down from the mountaintop into a cave mountain formed a natural clear spring, and after having the pool extend out the cave's cliff walls, leaning against it provided a perfect view of the scenery outside. After the flight of the island, this location became the best place to overlook the vistas provided by the land. Every day, Nightingale would soak in the spring water after showering and enjoy the spectacular sight. Compared to this, the lack of lights in the room was nothing. Just as Nightingale was about to lay down, she suddenly heard knocks on her. She was startled, it was already late in the night and the majority of the people were asleep. Who could it be? Coming. Nightingale responded and relit the candle, while thinking about potential candidates that might be at her door. The most probable choice was naturally Wendy. After all, this person in charge of the witch union had the precedent of coming to her for idle chats after having had a few drinks. But the person standing outside completely stunned her. It was Anna. Holding onto a small wooden bucket with a towel and toiletries, she asked, Can you accompany me for a bath? Nightingale had taken a bath prior to heading to bed, but knew that the main point was clearly not the bath. Of course, please give me a moment. Nightingale packed her things and followed Anna into the public bath, which was completely vacant and empty aside from the two of them. Occasionally, water droplets splashing onto the stalagmites could be heard emphasizing the serenity of the night. After stripping, Nightingale stepped into the pool and immediately felt the warmth envelop her entire body. Unlike Neverwinter, the island's fuel was limited, thus, the public bath employed the use of a boiler that relied on magic power to ensure a steady supply of hot water the entire day. The two walked through the white mist and slowly arrived at the entrance of the cave. Instantly, the refreshing night breeze swept the heat away as the world before their eyes opened up into a wide panorama. It was no longer edges and corners of the mountain stone, but stars in an endless night sky. Nightingale gasped slightly. The feeling was intoxicating. Anna seemed to be content and heaved a sigh. She then proceeded to stretch. Where's Roland? Most probably in the dream world. Is that so? He's really busy. That's right. Everyone claims that I've never stopped to take a break, but compared to him, my work is nothing. Anna chuckled. He even works through the night. You're equally as impressive as he is. Nightingale lowered her body until the water reached her shoulders. In the past, you were a young lady that knew nothing, but now, you're able to assume so much responsibility. It's really nothing much. Anna revealed a rare embarrassed expression. I'm only good at these aspects, if not for Berev and teacher Carl's help, the Ministry of Engineering would be in a mess. Hey hey, you can't just declare your shortcomings without any hesitation. Looking at Anna, complicated emotions rose within Nightingale, it was impossible to say that she did not feel indignation, clearly she had come into contact with Roland much earlier than Anna and had more opportunities 
but in the end, she was still a tad slower. But regardless of everything, she could not bring herself to hate Anna, her honesty, earnestness, and her straightforwardness. The longer one interacted with Anna, the more one could sense her purity. Nightingale had met countless people before, from ordinary citizens to nobility, yet none of them were as dazzling as her. She had complete respect for her. After a short silence, Anna changed the topic. What do you think will be the outcome of this battle of divine will? Nightingale realized that this might be the reason for being invited to share a bath. I guess. Very smoothly. She gazed up to the stars in the sky. In all honesty, inferring or predicting the outcome of a battle far exceeded her scope of abilities, and she did not know how to answer. But with the battle approaching, saying such things didn't seem too appropriate. Fortunately, Anna could not see through her lie. Oh. Anna did not echo her thoughts. I don't actually think so. Especially when the last objective is the bottomless land. Legends state that it is the land of God and I'm afraid that the risks involved with it far exceeds our estimates. For some reason, I feel that Roland might disappear any time, and the closer we get to the northern extremity, the stronger this uneasiness becomes. Nightingale's heart skipped a beat. Could it be that Anna might had sensed Roland's waning life expectancy? But that likely had to do with the realm of mind, and heading to the bottomless land was also a means to resolve the problem. It was not something that was inevitable. Maybe you're just over-worried about it. I hope so. Anna blinked. Right? Do you remember our agreement? Yes. Nightingale was taken aback for a moment, eh? I've decided to bring it forward. After we defeat the demons, I will talk to him personally. Why? Because of your uneasiness? That's half the reason, Anna replied gently. But more of it is that he needs you too. And I have never hated you. In the coming war, you'll have to take care of him. Nightingale was momentarily at a loss for words. She muttered after a long time, even so, why are you not stopping him from going to the bottomless land? Anna shook her head with a calm expression. This was the optimal plan after considering many factors, and regardless of the outcome, he has already made his preparations. How can I stop him? Being afraid and running away will not change anything, so the only thing I can do is to aid him with everything that I can, and witness the future with my own eyes.